All right, good evening and welcome to Bibliology and Bible Overview, BI 101, taught by the New Covenant College, uh, provided to you by the Institute here at the New Testament Baptist Church of Dover, Tennessee. We come now to our seventh lecture in our Bibliology portion of this class, and we are climbing the hill, and we are almost able to look out over the horizon, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, We've got to really flesh out, if you will, the conclusions of what we've laid down thus far in our study of bibliology. In our last lecture, we introduced several concepts that all fall under the banner of providential preservation. So those of you who have faithfully attended class, you will know that um, we began with just biblical epistemology, and then we talked about all of the different attributes of Scripture as it was given in the uh, autographs written by the prophets of God, Old and New Testament. And we said that that was the inspired, inerrant, infallible, sufficient Word of God, right? And uh, then we talked about last week and the week before the doctrine of providential preservation, providential preservation, that this original that was made there in the New Testament, that this original uh, was then providentially preserved down through the ages so that God's people had access to it. And we applied those concepts uh, to the history of the metacanon to illustrate the process by which God's people came to universally recognize the 66 books of the Bible as the Word of God. And we really focused that study on the 27 books of the New Testament. And we we used the principles of providential preservation to illustrate how the people of God came to recognize and realize and receive those 27 books as the Word of God, no more and no less. And we introduced some terminology last week. Uh, you'll remember the word meta-canon, M-E-T-A, meta-canon. That refers to the books of the Bible, the whole books of the Bible. And then the other word we learned was micro-canon, which refers to the text of the book. So there's, there's uh, two different ways to look at it. You have, you have a book. You know, this right here is a, is a book, and you can view it as a, as a whole but then also it has individual words within it that make up the text of the book. So you have that with the Bible as well. You have, for instance, Paul's epistle to the Romans. That's the book. But then you have the actual text within the book of Romans. So metacanon, microcanon. And we looked at the history of the metacanon in the last session. Tonight, our goal is very simple. What we will be doing is using the same principles of providential preservation that led us to the books of the Bible to now lead us to the text of the Bible, or the micro-canon, as we call it. So we will use the same principles that gave us our meta-canon to now give us our micro-canon. And essentially, we are arguing that the method of discerning the true text is fundamentally the same as the method to discern the true books. So as we'll see here in a minute, remember last week we talked about various books that were debated, okay, and, and, and there, the Christians were wondering, the church was trying to figure out, is this book really part of the Word of God, whether it be the book of Hebrews, which they eventually said, yes, it is, or whether it be the shepherd of Hermas, which they eventually said, no, it's not. And so there was a process by which they determined Uh, whether it was or whether it wasn't. And I'm going to submit to you tonight in this class that the process for determining the books is the same when we begin to discuss textual variants. So just like there have been uh, debated books all throughout history, there's also debated texts. There's different verses that um, Christians debate on whether or not they should be part of the book. They also debate over the particular reading of the verse. So sometimes these, these changes or these variants, is the technical word there, are very small and very subtle, but they have a, a much larger impact on the, the text as a whole. But fundamentally, fundamentally, they have a philosophical impact. For if God has preserved His word, there must be a true reading. And so how do we figure out what that true reading is? Well, the same way the church figured out 
uh, what the correct books were, the metacanon. So whether you're asking, should the book of 1 John be in the Bible? Okay, should the book of 1 John be in the Bible? Or whether you're asking, should 1 John 5, 7 be in the Bible? You're going to use the same principles to answer both questions. That's what we're positing this evening. And this is what is properly called the canonical argument for the text of Scripture. That is, we're not differentiating from the book and the text. We see it as a, as a comprehensive whole, and the arguments and the way we treat it and the way we discuss it is going to be the same for both. We don't discuss the books one way and then use a totally different set of rules when we get to the text. It's the same issue. Now, some object to this, they, and they say, well, you can't do that. You can't make the text a canonical issue. <laughs> Uh, you can't elevate the, the text and the variance to the same level as the book. Well, they might object and say, the Bible nowhere tells us which text is the true text. Now, those of us who advocate a particular form of the New Testament and say that this form of the New Testament is that which is probably digitally preserved, they will say, well, the Bible nowhere says which text. The Bible doesn't say you must use this manuscript and not that manuscript. And I would say, oh, you're right. But where does the Bible say that the 66 books are the canonical books? You see, it doesn't. So how do we discern? How do we figure out what is and is not the Word of God? You cannot know the true books or the true texts, the metacanon or the microcanon, apart from the self-authenticity of the word itself. And there's Christians who will admit that, yes, through the process of canonization and by divine authentication, the debate has been forever settled on the books. They say there's no questioning the 66 books of the Bible. If you, if you question one of the 66 books in the Bible, you're a heretic, okay? And they'll say that. And amen. But then when they get to textual variants, suddenly, well, we have to use a historical, critical, scientific process to figure out the true reading with these variants. And this is just simply illogical because you cannot be settled on the books and not be settled on the text of the books. Furthermore, let me just throw this in there. Um, if you use, so, so let, let's take the book of, uh, the book of Mark, for instance. The book of Mark was one of the most widely circulated books in the first century. It was one of the first to be received. The Acts and the Gospels were one of the first books to be received. Mark dominates the manuscript tradition. Okay? There's so much attestation to the Gospel of Mark. Yet, those who use this historical critical method of uh, deciding on the variants will often question the ending of the book of Mark and say that the, the last uh, was 11 verses of the book of Mark should actually not be in that gospel. Well, if you applied the same historical critical method to the book of 3 John, for instance, which 3 John, the whole book, is about the same size as the last chapter of Mark, well, you could very easily make the case to remove 3 John from the Bible. But these Christians would object and say, no, 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 the, the question of the metacanon is settled. We don't discuss the books any longer. So that's just one of the logical inconsistencies. But see, you cannot be settled on the books and not be settled on the text of the book. For instance, if you say the Gospel of John is the Word of God, no questions about it. Gospel of John should be received. It should be in the Bible. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad you think so. But let me ask you this, which version of John are you talking about? Are you talking about the version of John that has chapter 8 in it? <laughs> or the version of John that doesn't have chapter 8 in it? That's what we call the pericope adultere, pericope adultere, the, the, the story of the woman caught in adultery. Is that in the Bible or not? Is that canonical? Is it the Word of God? And furthermore, if we're allowed to have a book in the Bible, but we can take out variants and put in other variants, how, how long are we able to do that before we change the book so much that the substance is not even the same? See, so we must be settled on the text if we're able to be settled 
on the book. And that is the canonical argument. It posits that God authenticates his word over time by bearing witness upon the hearts of his people. And as he settles the books, okay, we saw last week that he settled the books, he also settles their respective texts. God did not authenticate the book of Mark on the hearts of his people and convince his people organically through the power of the Holy Spirit that Mark is the word of God and then leave giant question marks on the text of the book of Mark. He settled the book and he settled the text because it both makes up the canon, meta and micro. And so last week we saw how these principles of providential preservation settled the canon. And tonight we'll see how these same principles have settled the text of the Bible so that we can know with certainty what is the complete Word of God. Okay? We as believing bibliologists, as those who, who believe a, a bibliology from a faith-based, logic of faith viewpoint, we believe that we today can hold and discern and read and have full assurance that what we possess is the complete Word of God. So that's, that's very important when we look at that. So uh, what I want to do now is do a quick review of those principles of providential preservation. Just a quick review of them from last week. The first thing we discussed was uh, perpetual manifestation. Perpetual manifestation. And if you're saying, I've never seen this term before this class, <laughs> uh, that's because I, this is a term that I've kind of coined now, the concept is age-old. The concept is not new at all. The concept is simply this, that God's people have always possessed the true Word of God. That the true books of the Bible and their canonical texts were never hidden away or unknown to God's people. So I, I call this perpetual manifestation because the Bible perpetually manifests itself to God's people. And not only is it preserved, but it's available. Okay, So we're not saying that the Bible is preserved, but it, it's hidden away somewhere. might be in the sand over in Alexandria. might be in a library waste bin somewhere. Uh, no, it's perpetually manifested. Okay? So that's what we mean by that. The second principle of providential preservation is that of self-authenticity. Self-authenticity. And by this, we mean uh, that God's people possess the preserved word, right? They possess the preserved word, but there, there were corrupt books and textual variants that were also in circulation, you, right? We saw that last week with the books. We see it with the text. There's, there's tr the true word of God in book form, but then there's also these other books that we question. So self-authenticity answers the question, well, how did God's people discern the truly preserved word from the corruptions? And we answer it by saying that God authenticates his word by the witness of the Holy Spirit upon the hearts of his people. God authenticates his word upon the hearts of his people. And our particular Baptist ancestors, they uniformly agreed with this doctrine in their confession, the London Baptist Confession of 1689, chapter 1 and uh, paragraph 5, they say that uh, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. That's self-authenticity. Why do we believe that the Bible is the word of God? And how do we differentiate from the true word of God and a corrupt uh, version or a corrupt uh, copy by the witness of the Holy Spirit? Now there's plenty of natural evidences as well, but our supreme reason is by the witness of the Holy Spirit. And God did this with books, and God did this with texts. And we don't have a Bible today apart from the self-authenticity of the Word. The self-authenticity of the Word. That is, we know that the Bible is the Word of God because God has authenticated it. How has He done that? He's done that over time. Right? If He's doing it in our hearts, He's doing it over time. There was never one instance when God spoke from heaven and said, these are the 66 books in my Bible, and these are their canonical texts. He didn't do that. 
Uh, he did it in a way that fundamentally is a lot more sturdy and a lot more durable, and that is he did it over time. So we can see God working providentially. And we saw that last week with the books, did we not? How the, 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 the books that did not make the cut, eventually those books just fell away and no one even discussed them anymore. They fell out of the manuscript tradition. Why is that? Is that a, is that a coincidence or is that God providentially working in history? Friend, it's God providentially working in history, bearing witness upon his word and authenticating it. So that's self-authenticity. The third principle uh, that we looked at is the process of canonization. Canonization. And you'll note from this word canonization, you see the word canon right there, which we've already talked about. So you would see this canonization. So you know it's a verb. It's the process by which the canon was manifested. Now, nothing becomes canonical, right? The, the Word of God does not become the Word of God. Scripture is eternally the true Word of God, but God's people recognize the Word over time. So Hebrews was one of those debated books. Was there ever a period of time when Hebrews was not the Word of God and then Christians got together and made it the Word of God? Absolutely not. It was always the Word of God. But it's just that it took God's people some time to fully realize that. It took God's people some time to fully realize that. <clears throat> so, this uh, is a review of the principles of providential preservation. Keep that in mind as we uh, now look at the review of the history of the Meta Canon. And we're doing this review because really uh, the, the conversation on the Meta Canon is identical to the conversation on the Micro Canon. But we need to be aware of these principles if we're going to, able to be able to really dialogue and see how they fit together. So uh, let's review that history of the Meta Canon. We had what we called the Homo Legomenon, the Homo Legomenon. And those were the books that were universally accepted very, very early. The Homo Legomenon, uh, accepted very early. And then we had the Anti-Legomena, the Anti-Legomena, which were books that were debated and questioned well into the Middle Ages. Books that were debated and questioned well into the Middle Ages. Seven of these books, there were 13 of them, seven of these books would be solidified in the canon. And if you took notes, which you were supposed to, uh, the last session, you would have a list in front of you of those seven books that eventually made it into the canon. And then there were six books in the Antilogomena that did not make it into the canon. And they kind of just fell out of the manuscript tradition. So when did this debate, for all intents and purposes, end? When could we look to in history and say, after this particular time, nobody really debated the, the meta canon anymore. It was pretty much just these 27 books in the New Testament, no questions asked. Well, really, that happened around the time of the 1500s. Around the time of the 1500s. What was going on around the time of the 1500s? Well, God's people were largely returning to the truth of sola scriptura. Sola Scriptura. The Reformation was taking place and Christians were breaking away from the unbiblical ecclesiastical authority of Rome. Right? They, they were going against uh, the decree of Rome and the, the, the canon that Rome had declared at the Council of Trent, which posited the 66 books plus the Apocrypha in a Latin form. And the, the Christian believers who held to Sola Scriptura declared that, no, the canon are the, only the 66 books that God has authenticated. And it, when it comes to the New Testament, it's just these 27 that God has authenticated in their original forms of Hebrew and Greek. And so this is very important. Um, when we see that all of these lingering questions were essentially answered for good about the books of the Bible in the early 1500s. You had guys like Martin Luther, for instance, that really had serious questions about the book of James. And he had serious questions about the book of Revelation, for instance, questioning whether or not they should be in the Word of God. Now, was Martin Luther a, a, a raving heretic uh, for asking those questions? Well, no, he, he wasn't. And that's because he lived in a time period when these issues were just really starting to be settled out. Uh, I'd posit to you that there are some doctrinal and theological questions that we as Christians debate today that in 500 years from now or 1,000 years from now, nobody's going to be questioning them any longer. So 
We might be on the right side of some of those issues, but you know, we're probably on the wrong side of some of those issues as well. So we better be sure to judge men from the past in their historical context. But after the 1500s, that debate was pretty much taken care of. Nobody really questioned the Metacanon any longer. And Christians shortly after there began pinning confessions. 1689 is one of them, but there's numerous others where they affirmed this universally received position on the canon of Scripture. And ever since then, and all the way up until today, the, the canon is universally recognized as the 66 books that make up our Bible today, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. No questions asked about that. Um, now, the canonical argument would take the history of the meta canon, and it would say that God settled the debate, the debate over the books of Scripture, and at the same time, he settled the debate on the text of Scripture. That is to say that the history of the metacanon is parallel with the history of the microcanon. Because again, you cannot be settled on the books unless you're settled on the text. So they're hand in hand. So let's get into something new this evening. Let's talk a little bit about the history of the microcanon, the history of the microcanon. I'm just going to give you a very brief history of the text of the New Testament. Very brief. Uh, throughout the, the thousand years of church history, leading up to the 16th century, okay, so leading up to that providential time there in the 1500s, there were essentially Christians in the East and Christians in the West. The Christians in the East centered around a city called Constantinople. Uh, you'll remember the, the Con uh, Constantine, right, and Constantinople there in the east, and the Christians in the west centered around Rome, where you had the Roman Catholic Church, which also had other dissenting groups all throughout that time. And that was really where Christians primarily were populated, in the east and then in the west. And the Christians in the west used Latin manuscripts. They used Latin manuscripts. The Christians in the east, however, they still spoke Greek, and they had the Greek manuscripts. What's even more interesting than that is that the Greek Christians retained the Koine New Testament long after Koine Greek was no longer the common language. So if you know anything about Greek, you know that there's various kinds of Greek. You've got your, your ancient Greek, your Attic Greek, your Homeric Greek, your Kine Greek, your modern Greek, right? And uh, after Kine Greek had passed away, they still retained the Kine Greek New Testament. Very interesting to know. And uh, these Eastern Christians, not the Western Christians, possessed the preserved Word of God in the original language that God used to reveal His Word. Now, am I saying that the Latin manuscripts in the West were just totally deficient, not good at all? I'm not saying that. However, I am saying that the church has now recognized and understood that God has preserved His Word and kept it pure in all ages in the language that God used to first reveal it in. And it was the Greek church that had the Greek New Testament. Okay, So from, the, from man's perspective, and this, this, is the, this was the state of affairs in, let's say, 1400, what I just explained. So from man's perspective, the last thing you'd think would happen in the 1400s was for the common man in the West to get a Bible in his own language. They didn't have the access to the Greek text, and even if they did, uh, the Roman Catholic Church suppressed the use of the Bible by the common man. So it, it's just, there's no way that there's going to be a New Testament produced in the common vernacular from the true text in the 1400s in the West. It's not going to happen, right? Well, no, because God began to work in providence. And I would even care to venture that God well, used this time period when it seemed so unlikely to bring to pass what he did so that there'd really be no question that this was God working in providence. So what am I talking about? Well, 1453, 1453, Constantinople fell to the Turks. The Turks conquered Constantinople in 1453. And the Muslims began persecuting and oppressing those Greek Christians. So what did the Greek Christians do? Well, they began fleeing from the east, going west to escape Muslim persecution. 
And guess what the Greek Christians brought with them when they came west? They brought their Bibles in the language of Greek. So all of a sudden, you have the, the West is being flooded with Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, Greek manuscripts. Now, around, around this same time, around this same time, uh, Johannes Gutenberg was busy inventing the printing press. That uh, happened in around the year 1440. So 13-year difference. Uh, Constantinople fell to the Turks, and right about the time that printing press is really becoming uh, a wonderful invention that's kind of known by the scholastic field, these Greek manuscripts are flooding west where the printing press was invented. And at the turn of the century, that is, in the beginning of the 1500s, God used a man by the name of Desiderius Erasmus to publish the first printed edition of the Greek New Testament, Desiderius Erasmus. I'll write that up here as a matter of fact, because I want to show you the history of this Greek text anyways. So we had Erasmus in 1516 published the first ever printed Greek New Testament. Now, before this time period, before the 1500s, Bibles were hand copied. They were hand copied. The, the printing press gave us the ability to have a monolithic text, to have one printed text that was a compilation of all of these faithfully preserved manuscripts. So Erasmus produced several editions of the Greek New Testament. Uh, you'll hear some critics say that, well, his first edition was, was, was uh, no good. It was, it, well, yeah, it had some errors. It had some flaws in it. But guess what? It was a rough draft. And Erasmus produced, uh, uh, I think, a total of five editions. He produced many editions after his first in 1516. I might be wrong on that five number, but he produced several editions of the printed Greek New Testament. And then uh, a man by the name of Stephanus came along. He was the next uh, scholar to produce uh, printed editions of the Greek New Testament. His uh, best and most well-known edition, the Stephanus 1550. The Stephanus 1550 was produced. And this was a very prominent text of the New Testament, the Stephanus 1550. And now keep in mind, as we're getting further and further down the line, with each edition, it's becoming a little more refined, it's becoming a little more, uh, uh, I guess you could say, uh, practically perfect, right? Theoretically perfect, right? The inspired Word of God, but you're, you're removing printing errors, you're removing spelling errors, you're really nailing some things down, and the few textual variants that remained were being ironed out as these editions were being uh, done. So Stephanus was in 1550. Then you had a guy by the name of Theodore Beza, Theodore Beza was Calvin's successor in Geneva, and he would print four editions, and these four editions were really just a uh, reprint of Stephanus' 1550 with very minor changes. Okay, So you had a guy named Theodore Beza, and Beza produced a very well-known edition in the year 1598. Now, Beza's 1598 edition was the principal text used by the King James Bible translators. So Beza's 1598 was the chief text used by the King James translators. They did reference the other editions, but Beza was the one that they followed most closely. Okay, So they followed Beza. Uh, after Beza, you had the Elzevir brothers. You had the Elzevir brothers who came along, and they again were just really refining the work that had already been done. And they produced, I think it was in 1633 or 30. Um, yeah, 1633, Elsevier produced uh, a really well-known reprint of Stephanus's 1550 that really became the most popular uh, Greek text on the European continent at the time, was, was Elsevier's 1633. Okay, so you have... This is, what, this is the history of that Greek New Testament. Where did this Greek New Testament came, come from? Well, it was a compilation of the Latin manuscripts that the West already possessed, plus the Greek manuscripts that came from the East. Now, keep in mind, 
uh, even though the Greek was what God used to preserve his word, those Latin manuscripts were still very good and very reliable manuscripts. So the few places where the Latin didn't have it right, uh, Erasmus and others were able to use that Greek to really iron all the details out, so to speak. And then 1516 produces a New Testament in Greek because they understood, again, that Greek was the language that God used to give his word. Okay, So uh, by this time, by 1633, you've already got a lot of English Bibles produced. You've got a lot of English Bibles produced. And you have the King James Bible already in 1633. So you'll have guys that will, that will say, uh, well, the Textus Receptus, which, which TR do you hold to? Which, which edition do you hold to? Well, the thing about it is, all these editions, there's, there's so few differences in these editions. Uh, you can go on TextusReceptusBibles.org and you can read all of these editions. And if you're one who thinks that all of these editions had so many variants within them, I would just encourage you to read them all side by side and mark it down when you first come to a really significant difference. Okay, for instance, the King James Bible that we possess today, if you have a King James, a lot of people think this is the 1611. Well, truthfully, it's the 1769. This is Blaney's 1769 revision. The King James had revisions, it had eight revisions from 1611 to 1769. And immediately that makes us feel uncomfortable, right? Because, you know, we believe that this is God's preserved word. How can you revise God's preserved word? Well, friends, if you take the 1611, which you can purchase, Hendrickson Bible Publishers, they produce uh, a, a replica of the 1611. If you take the 1611 and you read it side by side with the 1769, it would be preposterous to say that the 1769 is a different text than the 1611. It's preposterous. Now, we're not going to get into this tonight, but there are people out there, there is a whole camp of people, that really hold to a distorted view of the word perfection. And they would say that to be perfect, it, it really means you have to have the same exact spelling, the same exact syllable pronunciation. You know, you have to have the commas in all the right places, the periods in all the right places. And if that's your standard, then yes, I guess the 1611 is different than the 1769, but substantially it is the same text in the same way that all of these Textus Receptuses produce the same text. It's the same text. Um, there's minute differences that are being discussed with the Textus Receptus, but there's nothing being discussed like the variants that we discuss in our day. They, they were men who believed that they had the Word of God, believed that they possessed the Word of God. They, don't, they, they weren't trying to reconstruct something that was lost, in other words. So that's, that's basically what you have with these additions. And it was this, the reason why we're calling it the text of Receptus or the received text is because it was this form of the Greek New Testament that was universally received by all Christians. That's why it's called the received text, because it was received. Furthermore, it was based on the readings from the majority of manuscripts that Christians had always possessed. One of the common mistakes that you'll hear people make when they're talking about the history of the, of the Bible and the history of the text is they'll equate the majority text or the Byzantine text with the received text. They're two different things. They're similar, but they're two different things. The majority text, and there is a majority text, a one majority text, it's, it is uh, based on a whole host of variants produced in that family, whereas your received text is a compilation and revision of the readings possessed by Christians down through the ages. That's not anything new, is what I'm saying to you. This right here, this received text, is a compilation of the reading that Christians had always had. It's a text that the church worked with and worked on for centuries. And when we look at what God did through history, when we look at the fall of Constantinople and the invention of the printing press and the, the Reformation that brought believers back to Sola Scriptura and we look at the, the metacanon being ironed out, we see that this is the providence of God. And then as we see the language, the lingua franca of the world, as we see English becoming a very prominent language and God's people more and more began to speak English, we see Bibles in English that are being produced, culminating in the King James Bible, of 1611. Now, we said that uh, Beza was the text most followed by the King James Bible, but they did reference other, uh, other versions of the Textus Receptus. Now, again, if you, want to, if you want to try to 
uh, nitpick, I would just recommend, if, if you can, take the King James Bible and read it side by side with all these variations and count the number of times that the King James doesn't follow Beza and follow something else or uh, you, you, where, where you don't see the text in the King James represented in one of these traditions. You'll never really find anything of any significance. This is one text. The King James is one text, and it follows. Now, there was, in 1894, an edition of the Textus Receptus produced by a guy named F.H. A. Scrivener. Scrivener produced an edition of the Textus Receptus in 1894. And what Scrivener did was Scrivener took all these editions of the TR that, again, are basically the same text, and he took the King James Bible, and he took Beza's edition. So really, Scrivener is a, is a reprint and a revision of Beza, but in the places where the King James differed from Beza and followed another edition, Scrivener uh, used those editions in his revision of Beza. So Scrivener and Beza are practically identical. The only variations would be the few places where the King James departed from Beza and followed another edition. Uh, I have right here Scrivener. Uh, this is an interlinear with, with the Scrivener text, but it really makes no difference. You could have an interlinear with Stephanus or an interlinear with Beza, and, and it would take you forever to find anything of any kind of significance. It's, it's one text. And really, the, the King James, you can, the, the best way to look at the King James Bible the best way to look at the King James Bible is not to look at it as some new work that God did in 1611, but to look at the King James as a continuation of God preserving his word. The King James is itself a received text. So the King James is based on the majority readings that were then compiled and revised in the Greek Textus Receptus and then translated into English. So the King James itself is a received text. And this form of the Greek New Testament reigned supreme for centuries after it was produced, just like the King James Bible has reigned supreme in the centuries after it was produced. That's what it means for something to be a received text. So that's what we have with the Textus Receptus. This is the Textus Receptus. This is how we got the Textus Receptus. And so the context of the 15th and 16th century set the stage for the settling of the New Testament books and the text of the New Testament. And we see both debates over the metacanon and the microcanon virtually being closed uh, at that period of time as Christians are confessing the books of the Bible and here's what's interesting. They're confessing their canonical forms confessing their canonical form. See, in the 1689, the framers confess the canon, the metacanon, in chapter 1 and paragraph 2. They, they provide a list of the books that they believed were Scripture, right? And they weren't writing anything new. They were recording what the church had universally come to receive at that time. But in chapter 1 and paragraph 8, they confess the textual form of these books. They said this, the Old Testament in Hebrew which was the native language of the people of God of old, and the New Testament in Greek, which was at the time of the writing of it, was most generally known to the nations, being immediately inspired by God, and by a singular care and providence kept pure in all ages, are therefore authentic. What were they saying? They were saying that the Greek New Testament, not the Latin New Testament, the Greek New Testament was the one that was inspired and kept pure in all ages. And let me ask you this, what Greek text were they referring to? They were referring to the Greek New Testament that they had, this received text. They weren't talking about some potential Greek New Testament in the future. They weren't talking about a Greek New Testament that the church didn't possess for 1,800 years. Think about that. They said that the Greek New Testament, which we have and which the church has always had, that's the one inspired by God, that's the one that has been kept pure in all ages, and that's the one that's authentic. So, God settles the debate over the metacanon and the microcanon with the 27 books in the New Testament, the 39 books of the Old Testament, and their canonical forms in Hebrew and Greek. And this 
conclusion was practically unchallenged for 300 years. For 300 years, there was really no one questioning this form of the Greek New Testament or questioning the 66 canonical books, except for heretics. And just like uh, no one was questioning the, the books, they weren't questioning the texts until around the turn of the 20th century. The 20th century, so mid-1800s, early 1900s, we have the development of what is now known as the critical text. The critical text. And we will discuss the modern critical text and the, the uh, philosophy of the modern critical text position in our next session. We're not going to get into that tonight. But it's just important for you to know that this Greek text, which the church always possessed in the East, came to the West, and then was then printed by the printing press. And this was the text that the church has always received. It's not anything new that came to be in the 1500s or the 1600s. It's what the church always had, what we still have today. This text is still accessible today in digital form and printed form. You can find this text. You can read this text. And you can read it knowing assuredly that what you're reading is the text that Christians have always had and will always have because Jesus has promised to preserve his word. So we'll discuss the critical text and perhaps some challenges posed to the received text in our next session. But what I want to leave you with tonight, uh, there's a scholar out in Arizona by the name of Taylor DeSoto. He's a uh, really a premier scholar on this issue. And he recently published an article in which he mentioned 15 points of believing bibliology. 15 points of believing bibliology. And I've made some modifications to this because he gets into some deeper waters that we're not getting into tonight. Uh, and I've slimmed it down to 14 thinner points, but this basically comes from him. And these 14 points that I'm going to give you, they really sum up everything we've talked about thus far in this class. So these 15 or 14 points now really sum up everything we've discussed. The first point is this. God has voluntarily condescended to man by way of speaking to man. Okay. Biblical epistemology. Second point, in the time of the people of God of old, he spoke by way of the prophets, Hebrews 1, 1. In these last days, he has spoken to his people by his son, Jesus Christ, Hebrews 1, 1. Fourth point, the way that God has spoken by Jesus Christ is in Scripture through the inspiration of the biblical writers by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is the Word of God, and in these last days is the way that Christians hear the voice of their shepherd by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible does not contain the Word of God or become the Word of God. It is the Word of God. That's point number four. Point number five. The purpose of this speaking is to make man wise unto salvation and furnished unto all good works. That's why God has given us His Word, that we might be wise to salvation and that we might then be able to exhibit the good works that God requires of us. Sixth point. Jesus promised that His Word would never fall away as it is the means of accomplishing His covenant purpose. Jesus promised that His Word would never fall away. Seventh point. Since God has promised that His words would not fall away, the words of Scripture have been kept pure in all ages or in every generation until the last day. Providential preservation. Eighth point. Eighth point. Up until the 15th century, with the invention of the printing press in Europe, books were hand copied. Okay? This hand copying resulted in thousands of manuscripts being circulated and used in churches for all matters of faith and practice. So if you go to a church in the 600s, 700s, 500s, 300s, 800s, 900s, you're going to find a handwritten copy. And that was what they used as the authoritative preserved Word of God. These manuscripts are generally uniform. Keep that in mind. Some people think that you know, all these manuscripts are saying a whole bunch of different things, but that's not true at all. The men who were copying these scriptures were generally doing a superb job. They were generally uniform, except for a handful of corrupt manuscripts. So you had a, a handful of corruptions mixed in with the true reading. That's why, again, we believe that the true reading is to be found in the majority manuscript, in the majority text, the majority of the manuscripts. So, a couple corruptions, a handful of corruptions in a few manuscripts. Now, 
When Constantinople fell in 1430, uh, 1453, just 13 years after the invention of the printing press in Europe, Greek Christians fled to the West, bringing with them their Bibles and language. That's all in point eight. Point nine, the printing press was put to use in the creation of printed Bibles in many different languages, specifically Greek and Latin. Specifically Greek and Latin. Point number 10. If it is true that the Bible has been kept pure, and it is, then we can know that it was kept pure up to the 16th century. So if the Bible has been kept pure, it was pure in the 16th century. So Erasmus, did, it's not like the Bible uh, was pure and then fell away in the 800s, and by the time it got to Erasmus, it was corrupt, and Erasmus didn't have the Word of God, and then the, over the last couple hundred years, we've been reconstructing it to get the pure text. No, it's kept pure in all ages. It was pure in the Apostles' day. It was pure in the 500s. It was pure in the 1000s. And it was pure in Erasmus' day. So it was pure in the 16th century. Thus, the manuscripts that were used in the first effort of creating a printed text was the same text used by the people of God up to that point. The text used to create what became known as the Textus Receptus was the same text used by God's people up until the 16th century. Text critics such as Theodore Beza would appeal to the consent of the church as part of their textual methodology, which demonstrates that the reception of readings by the church were an integral part of the compilation of this text. What does that mean, the consent of the church? Well, Beza was essentially saying, when Beza got to a, a, a variant, okay, and Beza was thinking, hmm, what is the true reading? What would Beza do? He would say, well, what have God's people always thought the true reading was? That's the consent of the church. Looking back and saying, uh, did they think it was A or did they think it was B? Yet, uh, those who follow the more historical critical method, they have totally abandoned that principle. When they come to a textual variant, they don't say, well, what did God's people always think it was? Right? We should be asking that question. Why? Because God's kept his word pure in all ages, and he's manifested it to his people. They had the pure word. They had the correct reading. So if we were having questions about it, what was the majority opinion on this variant? That will answer our question. Point 11. The text produced over the course of a century during the Reformation period was universally accepted by the Protestants, even to the point of other texts being rejected. It is historically documented that this is the text received by all, which is abundantly made clear in the commentaries and confessions and translations and theological works up until the 19th century. So from the 1500s to the 1800s, there was no question about this text. That's what he's essentially saying in point number 11. You look at all your commentaries, all your theological works, they're all using this Greek text and they're receiving it as the Word of God. They're saying this is the text that Christians universally believe to be the Word of God. Point 12. This Greek text, along with the Masoretic Hebrew text, remained the main text for translation, commentary, theological works for several centuries after it was compiled. All of your English versions prior uh, or, or leading up to the King James, prior to the Revised Standard Version, they all came from this Greek text. Thus, the received text position adopts the Greek and Hebrew text and translations thereof that were received by all in the age of printed Bibles and used universally by the Orthodox Christians for over 300 years practically uncontested except by Roman Catholics and other heretical groups. So the only groups out there that questioned th this text were Roman Catholics and other heretical groups. But all Christians that believed the, the gospel of God's grace in Jesus Christ, they held to this text. That was their Bible. Point 14, the last point. The most popular of these translations from this Greek text is the authorized version, the King James Version, and it's still, to this day, the most predominantly received Bible today. The received text is still being received, and it's going to keep being received because God has promised providential preservation to His Word, and He's promised to authenticate it in the hearts of His people. So these 14 points, hope you jotted them down. They're very important because they really 
are the culmination of the logic of faith. And it's what it means to hold to a received text position. So when we say we hold to a received text position, that doesn't mean that we're just another form of King James onlyism. It's not King James onlyism at all. What it is is saying that we believe that God has providentially preserved his word and we can find that word in the text that his people have always used as scripture. So in the next couple of lectures, we're going to look at, two, at some alternative views of preservation, uh, some alternative views of where the text has been preserved, and some challenges that these views pose to the textus receptus. But I'd encourage you to study the information that we went over tonight. I know it, maybe it felt like uh, drinking from a fire hose. It's a lot of information to go over. But it's very important if you're going to be consistent in your belief of bibliology. So pray this was a blessing to you, and we look forward to seeing you the next lecture.